Well, greetings to you, Grace Bible Fellowship. I come from Grace Life Church with greetings to you. It's a blessing to be here. I am so thrilled to get to meet this body of believers that I've heard so much about. We are so grateful for this church and grateful for this town. I mean, even the, the place that this town serves in the context of our province, we are truly grateful for you and grateful for your support. You were wonderful as a church to support my family while I was in prison. My wife has told me about the cards and gifts that were sent to her to support her in that time. And so thank you for loving my family in that way. And I just need to say at the outset that I know God loves LaCrete. And the, the, the way that I know that is that Mike Hovland and his family are here. That, that God would send Pastor Mike here to this land to plant a church is truly evidence of his love for LaCrete. And you, you need to understand this, and I'm sure you're, you're, if you don't know this already, you're getting to know this, that you have a phenomenal man of God, and man of God in the truest sense of the term. Mike is in that group that belonged to the cream of the crop on earth and he is here in the Crete to bring the word of God to you and to care for your soul and to shepherd you. And that's, we haven't even got to Jody and the boys yet. So, I mean, you guys are phenomenally blessed. And it's a blessing to be here and to minister the word of God to all of you. And so I am truly, truly grateful. There is no doctrine that humbles man more than the sovereignty of God and salvation. Man is utterly incapable of effecting his own salvation. And there is no aspect, no element of salvation that accentuates the sovereignty of God more than the doctrine of regeneration. To be saved, you must be made alive, raised to newness of life, you must be made a new creation, whereby in an act likened to creation itself, God would shine in your heart to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Christ, 2 Corinthians 4, 6. You must experience the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit, Titus 3, 5 whereby you receive the very life of God within you, eternal life. And so to be saved, something must happen to you. Something that is completely outside of your control. Something that you can do absolutely nothing to bring about. And that's going to be the focus of our time today. As we dig into John chapter 3, and the necessity of the new birth. And the context here is important, so open your Bible to John chapter 3 for a moment. Because the context of the discussion that takes place in the portion of Scripture we're going to be in today is significant in setting the stage for this dialogue between Jesus and Nicodemus. And to appreciate the context you have to understand that Jesus is in Jerusalem. And he's, he's there for the feast of Passover. And he's been there for about a week. And the whole week really began by Jesus going into the temple to cleanse it. To clear out the, the money changers. And then Jesus stayed on in Jerusalem during the feast and performed many signs. And people were believing in him. And yet it was a deficient faith. It was inadequate faith. It wasn't saving faith. And so though people were believing into Jesus, Jesus wasn't entrusting himself to them. And to see this, look at verse 23. Chapter 2. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name. And you would think this is going well. Jesus is in Jerusalem, performing many signs, and they're believing in his name. Observing his signs, it says, which he was doing. But, verse 24, Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. 
and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. There is a faith that saves, and there is a faith that does not. The one that doesn't is a natural faith. It's produced by man. It originates with man. The, the faith that saves is a, a supernatural faith that originates with God and is from above, generated by the Spirit of God. And it's this notion of inadequate faith, this deficient faith expressed by many who are believing into Jesus at the Passover that sets the stage for this discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus. Because Nicodemus is an example of one with deficient faith. A faith that does not save. And so here's what we're going to see today. We're going to see the necessity of the new birth. That you must be born again. And we're going to see the nature of the new birth. That the new birth is a sovereign work of the Spirit that is both inscrutable in its taking place and yet undeniable in its effects. When the Spirit works, there's a, a mysteriousness about that work, and yet when He works, you cannot deny it because His impact on the life of an individual who's been born from above is evident to all. But, before we get to that, I want you to see the evidence for the new birth. Seen in the life of Nicodemus. Where Nicodemus proves that you must be born again. Because if Nicodemus needs the new birth, then we all need the new birth. And so look with me at John chapter 3, reading from the New American Standard. I want to read the verses, the opening verses up to verse 8. John 3, chapter 1, read with me. It says, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. And that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. So we're going to be in John 3, 1 to 8. And what I want you to note first is the evidence for the new birth. The evidence for the new birth. And this comes out in verses 1 and 2. Look at verse 1 with me. It says there, Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. And the way that John connects this verse to what we just read a moment ago at the end of chapter 2 is rather intriguing. Notice again the way Verse 25 ends, it says there, for he himself knew what was in man. And now again, verse 1, now there was a man. And so Jesus is about to read the heart of Nicodemus. And it's important to understand who Nicodemus is. He was a Pharisee. He belonged to the most fastidiously religious sect of Judaism. He belonged to the class in Jerusalem, and really you could just say in the world at that time, to the religious elite. He had a resume that likely rivaled the Apostle Paul's, circumcised the eighth day of the nation of Israel. As to the righteousness which is in the law, found blameless. 
And that was on top of the fact that the Jews already believed that they were granted entrance into the kingdom. That the kingdom was there to lose. Theirs to lose. They, they believed the kingdom was theirs by right. And yet Nicodemus here belongs to the, the religious elite even within that system. And he had achieved the heights of religious prestige. He belonged to the group that had assumed the chair of Moses. He was a teacher of the law. He wore the, the religious garb of the day. He held a chief seat in the synagogue. Was respected by all and even addressed as rabbi by all. And on top of that, you'll note there that it says that he is a ruler of the Jews. Which meant he was on the Sanhedrin. He was on the, the ruling body, the ruling council of the nation. Really likened to the Supreme Court. And so Nicodemus was in elite company. He was among the best of the best. And yet he's troubled. He likely has no inner sense of assurance. Filled with all kinds of doubt. That's what you get when you are trying to establish your own righteousness by law. And he's wrestling, no doubt, with the true significance of the signs that Jesus is performing. And so, verse 2, it says, This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you've come from God as a teacher. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. A couple things to notice about this. Jesus, or rather Nicodemus, came to Jesus by night. And there are a few different options for understanding why it might be. Some say it has no significance at all. That John is simply telling us what happened and Nicodemus came to Jesus by night. Others say it's consistent with the practice of the Pharisees. That the, the, the Pharisees apparently gave their, their nights to study. Others say it was to avoid the crowds. That it would have been a very difficult thing to have a meaningful and even extended conversation with Jesus with all of the crowds surrounding him. And still others say Nicodemus wanted to avoid being seen. That he didn't want this visit to Jesus to become public knowledge. And I tend to think it's the last two options that are noted there. He wanted the undivided attention of Jesus. And he didn't want the Sanhedrin or any of the other Pharisees to know that he had gone to see Jesus. Because that would have brought reproach upon him. In fact, you can kind of get a taste of this in John 7. Turn there for a moment. In, in John 7, Nicodemus speaks up in a moment when the Pharisees are trying to ultimately arrest Jesus. And he speaks up and tries to hold the group to a, a legitimately righteous standard, and yet he ends up being chided for it. In John 7, verse 45, it says this, The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees, and they said to them, that is, to the officers, Why did you not bring him? They were supposed to bring Jesus. He was supposed to be arrested. The officers answered, Never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. The Pharisees then answered them, You have not also been led astray, have you? No one of the rulers or Pharisees has believed in him, has he? But this crowd, which does not know the law, is accursed. Verse 50, Nicodemus, who came to him before, being one of them, referring to that, what we're looking at in John 3, said to them, Our law does not judge a man unless it first hears from him and knows what he is doing, does it? Look at verse 52. They answered him, You are not also from, the, from Galilee, are you? Search and see to it that no prophet arises out of Galilee. By even speaking up in that moment, Nicodemus was ultimately chided and suffered reproach among his brethren. And so Nicodemus knows that if this visit is to be found out, 
then he is going to have to suffer reproach. And at that point in time, he was not prepared to do that for Jesus. And so he comes to Jesus by night. And as I said a moment ago, he expresses the kind of inadequate faith that we see in John 2, 23 through 25. Again, look at it. Rabbi, we know that you have come from God as a teacher, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. This is what we could call sign faith. They're believing because of the signs. He respectfully calls Jesus rabbi. He acknowledges Jesus as a teacher. He even acknowledges that Jesus has come from God. And yet all of that is deficient, inadequate, superficial, and he's troubled. Humanly speaking, he had everything going for him, but lacked any sense of real assurance. And this is what you need to understand about this. Nicodemus epitomizes the absolute best that works righteousness can achieve. This is the best that it gets. This is the best that you can do trying to establish a righteousness of your own by the law. He had gone as far as one can go. You, you can't improve on this. This is the best that, that works righteousness can do. And yet our Lord's description of the Pharisees found in Matthew 23 would have applied to Nicodemus all the same. He was a hypocrite. He would teach one thing and then go and do another. He was shutting people off from the kingdom of God. He didn't even know how to enter himself. He was a son of hell and would have made his disciples twice as much a son of hell as he was. He was a blind guide, as spiritually blind as the most immoral people of their nation and of the world. He was a fool, incapable of exercising righteous discernment. He would tithe mint, dill, and cumin, but would neglect the weightier things of the law, justice, mercy, faithfulness. He was clean on the outside, but, but, but inside was full of robbery and self-indulgence. He was a whitewashed tomb, appearing beautiful on the outside, but inside was full of dead men's bones. That is quite a description but again, that is exactly what you get with works righteousness. That is the best works righteousness can do. And Nicodemus might have been even the best the Pharisees had to offer. He at least recognizes Jesus from God. Many of the Pharisees were saying that he was doing what he was doing by the power of Beelzebul. The power of Satan. But even the very best that man can achieve is utterly bankrupt. You see, he's the evidence that we need the new birth in and of ourselves. We have no capacity. We are incapable of doing anything that would please God. He is not only unimpressed by our human religiosity, he despises it. And at best, that's what Nicodemus had. Dead religion. And what's interesting about that is you might be the exact opposite of Nicodemus. You, you could be here and be one who couldn't actually put forward the resume of all of the achievements, humanly speaking, of, of, of religious progress. Maybe far from living an immoral life, or rather a moral life, your life may be full of immorality. But you would follow in the same footsteps as Nicodemus if you think you can rectify your situation on your own. That if you just clean up your life a little bit and attempt a degree of behavioral change, then you can fix this thing. Can't be done. Salvation requires something far more radical than that. Something that only God can do. We need the very same thing that Nicodemus needs. And Nicodemus needs to understand why he's troubled. 
And so Jesus is going to read his heart and answer a question that Nicodemus hasn't even asked yet. So note second, we come now to the necessity of the new birth. The necessity of the new birth. Verse 3. Jesus answered and said to him, truly, truly, I say to you. Truly, truly. A solemn attestation. Expressing the absolute certainty of what Jesus is about to say. And here it is. Unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Jesus cuts right to the chase. The only way Nicodemus or anyone else is going to see the kingdom of God is by new birth. John only refers to the kingdom of God twice in this gospel, once here and a second time in verse 5. And in John, it's synonymous with eternal life, with salvation. And so entrance into the kingdom of heaven necessitates being born again. And that word there, again, can also be rendered from above. And so Jesus is saying that salvation necessitates a birth that's from heaven. A birth that is of a completely different kind and realm than physical birth. This birth is internal. It brings new life to the inner person. It transforms from the inside. It takes a person from spiritual death to spiritual light, from darkness to light. Where the very life of God, eternal life, begins to pulsate through your spiritual veins. It results in a new heart. It grants new desires. It washes and cleanses from all sin and moral defilement. It pours out the love of God within our hearts so that we begin to love God with a, a love not, not even our own. It is nothing less than regeneration. And Jesus says this, that unless this happens to you, you cannot be saved. Now, you got to put yourself in the shoes of Nicodemus. Jesus has just told him that his religion is useless. Again, he is speaking to one from among the most religious people on the planet. And all of it amounts to nothing. Zero. Zilch. And he's telling Nicodemus there's nothing he can do. No work he can perform. No steps he can take. He must be born from above, and he has no power in himself to bring it about. And, and he understands this. Look at verse 9 and how he responds there. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? His whole life is a waste. He's been completely unmasked. He is no closer to God than the, the Gentile somewhere else who has never even heard the name Yahweh. And so he provides the perfect object lesson. If it was possible to enter the kingdom of God any other way, Nicodemus would have done it. And yet he was no closer than the immoral individual who had zero religion. He was religious. He may have been sincere. He was active in ministry. He was seemingly devoted to God. He was outwardly moral. He even believed Jesus was from God. And yet he was no closer to seeing the kingdom than someone who wasn't any of those things. And it's at this point in time that, that if, you're, if you're coming under the weight of this, that you're looking for some sort of nuance. You, you're looking for some way to, to, to bring this down. It, it sounds impossible, Pastor James, and, and it is impossible with man. 
You see, we want some way to make this attainable, truth from God's word that would bring it within our reach, where we could exercise a measure of control over this, and it's not there. There's nothing to offer. Any effort to bring the necessity of the new birth down would fundamentally alter what it is. One must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And in the same way that you made no contribution to your physical birth, you can make no contribution to this birth. And this comes out in verses 4 and following. So no third. The nature of the new birth. The nature of the new birth. Look at verse 4. Here, our Lord makes an assertion, one that he's reiterating. Verse 4, it says, Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? He can not enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And before we get to the assertion, note that there are a few different ways to take this question. One is that Nicodemus is completely clueless, hasn't got the foggiest idea what Jesus is talking about. That he completely failed to understand what Jesus was saying. And so some say the question posed here is indicative of that failure. He simply doesn't get it. Another is that he understands but finds it absurd. And so there's a, a degree of ridicule in this question. How can a man be born again? He can't enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? And yet that doesn't jive because... As this discussion unfolds, by the end of it, Nicodemus is completely undone, totally ruined. He understands what Jesus is saying. And so I think there's a better option. I think he understands. But he only understands what Jesus is saying to this point. He understands that he must be born again. He understands that this must take place if he is to see the kingdom of God. He even understands that this is something that must happen to him, that there's nothing he can do to bring this about. But what he doesn't understand is the terminology. This is new terminology. Jesus is speaking with the language of, we might say, the New Testament. Nicodemus has a different frame of reference. What is it? It's the Old Testament. And so in this question, Nicodemus is seeking clarification. He needs Jesus to put this in terminology he understands. Language that jives with his pre-existing categories of theology. And so Jesus is going to oblige him. As if to say, you want me to put that differently? Okay. Maybe this will sound familiar. Try this on for size. Verse 5, Jesus answered, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Does that ring a bell, Nicodemus? And it certainly would have. Nicodemus would have been very familiar with the Old Testament, maybe having much of it or many portions of it memorized. He might have even been able to give chapter and verse on the reference that Jesus is referring to here. Even though he clearly failed to understand its implications for his own life. And so Jesus is here referring to the Old Testament. And we know that because even in verse 10, he chides Nicodemus saying to him, are you the teacher of Israel and do not understand these things? I mean, if you're the teacher of Israel, you have the Old Covenant, the Old Testament, and you claim to be a teacher, you should understand this, Nicodemus. You should be a teacher of this reality, Nicodemus. And the specific passage that Jesus has in view here is Ezekiel 36. So turn there. There are two definitive portions of scripture in the Old Testament that address the new covenant. One is in Jeremiah, 
The only place the new covenant is referenced, Jeremiah 31 to 34, the other is here where the new covenant isn't expressed in those terms, but nevertheless the actual, the reality of it is articulated. And as we read this, Ezekiel 36, 25 to 27, I want you to notice the I wills. God is the one speaking, and he is declaring that he is going to sovereignly and monergistically, where he is the only active agent, he is going to, to be the one at work and acting in this. And so look with me at it. Ezekiel 36, verse 25 says this, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and you will be clean. There's water. And I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. Moreover, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you. There's the spirit of God. And cause you to walk in my statutes. There it is to be made alive, to be raised on the newness of life, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. And so Jesus is saying that unless God sprinkles you clean with water, cleansing you from all your moral defilement, unless he gives you a new heart and puts his spirit within you, unless all of that takes place, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. And then Jesus expresses this as an axiom, which is a, a statement that is self-evident. So back in John 3 in verse 6, to fortify the, the assertion in verse 5, Jesus says this, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Which is to say this, that even if you could enter back into your mother's womb and have a second birth, it would be of no use. It would make no difference. The flesh begets flesh. The, the, the flesh produces flesh. The flesh is incapable of producing the life above, spiritual life. And by flesh here, Jesus doesn't mean the sinful flesh. He's using flesh more to describe just natural earthly existence. It originates from that which is created. It lacks the life of God, eternal life. It simply makes one a member of the human race, but not a child of God. In contrast, though, again, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Where spirit refers to life above only the Spirit can produce spiritual life in a person. It's spiritual life that is needed in order to enter the kingdom of God, where the very life of God would enter you such that you would possess eternal life. And there's a wonderful statement in John 6 and verse 63. You can turn there where this is said in very clear and straightforward terms. There Jesus says, as he has many disciples who are about to depart from him, who had expressed this, in, this inadequate faith, this deficient faith, he then says this, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. In fact, even look at John 8, 23. There, Jesus expresses really the same contrast, but in slightly different language. In John 8, 23, it says, and he was saying to them, you are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. And so the flesh is from below. It's earthly and of this world, but the Son and the Spirit are from above and are not of this world. 
And really, you get a, a little glimpse of the glory of the gospel in this, because Jesus belonging to the realm above and therefore possessing in himself eternal life, spiritual life, became flesh and dwelt among us so as to redeem us and make us partakers of that life. He adds to himself human flesh, dies for our sins, and grants us eternal life. And really, you can just amplify the, the significance of the axiom back in John 3, 6 by noting the fact that not only is the flesh from below, but even compounding that fleshliness, as it were, we have the, the sinful flesh. So our, our earthliness is even compounded. Not only are we of the flesh in a natural sense, we are also of the flesh in a fallen sense. And so we're born with physical life, all the while remaining spiritually dead, slaves to sin, unable to please God, spiritually blind. And so the Spirit must come and make us alive, breaking the power of sin, giving spiritual life, spiritual sight, and even granting us faith to believe. And so what's the axiom in a nutshell? Like produces like. Like produces like. Flesh begets flesh. Spirit begets spirit. Simple, basic, self-evident. And yet maybe a, an analogy would be helpful. And the Lord gives us that. What can the work of the Spirit in regeneration be likened to? Verse 7, John 3, Do not be amazed that I said to you, you must be born again. Let me note just something here. To be amazed is to be extraordinarily impressed or disturbed. Which one is Nicodemus? Is he extraordinarily impressed or is he extraordinarily disturbed? He's disturbed. And note that you must be born again is not a command. The word rendered must is a word that speaks to necessity. It can also be rendered, it is necessary. And so Jesus is saying, do not be amazed that I said to you, it is necessary to be born again. And then he describes the work of the Spirit. Verse 8, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. Our Lord here is likening the work of the Spirit to the wind. And I want you to see three features of this analogy. One is that the wind blows where it wishes. Which is to say you can't control the wind. In fact, there's a sense in which Jesus presents the wind as sovereign in this analogy. And the work of the Spirit is being likened to the wind. Two, you hear the sound of it referring to the wind, which is to say that its effects are undeniable. When wind is present, it is undeniable. If a massive hurricane were to go through La Crete, it would be undeniable. Visibly apparent, the wind is present. You can hear it, you can see it, you can feel it. Its effects are undeniable. And yet three, Jesus says, but do not know where it comes from and where it is going. It is inscrutable. It is mysterious. You could be outside on a beautiful day with no wind and all of a sudden a gust just comes out of nowhere. Where, where did it come from? We don't know. God knows. End of verse 8. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. The Spirit is sovereign in regeneration. He brings life to whomever He wishes. When He regenerates... The effects of it are undeniable. Just like the presence of the wind, when a person goes from death to life, darkness to light, it is apparent. 
something has happened to them. They've been changed on the inside. And the evidence of that change begins to bear fruit on the outside. And his work is mysterious and inscrutable. Two people can hear the same message. One can walk away and declare that is utter foolishness. The other can walk away and declare that is the power of God unto salvation. And so the new birth is a sovereign work of the Spirit that is both inscrutable in its occurrence and yet undeniable in its effects. And if you've been born from above, then you know this. You know everything that I've been saying this entire time. You know what it is to go from death to life, from darkness to light. You know what it is for the Spirit of God to open your eyes where you can now see, where you see the honor and glory of Christ and he's attractive to you, where you have a, a love and a desire for God and to follow God and obey God and do his will, where you want real righteousness, not a sham righteousness like Nicodemus that's all external, but one that's from the inside where there's integrity and truth. And yes, though you battle with the ongoing principle of sin within you, nevertheless, you, you desire holiness and purity and obedience. And you know that perfection, as we've already sung this morning, isn't going to be until glorification of future reality. And so you understand this. You, you know this. There's a love for the brethren in your heart. When you meet other believers, you, you, you love them. There's affection and you want to serve them and bless them. And you have trusted Christ for the forgiveness of sins. Then you can sing, it is well with my soul. Amen? Let's pray together. Father God, we are so grateful for your word. So grateful for this portion of scripture. These are truths that challenge us and can even bring about a degree of introspection as we assess our lives and consider whether we can see spiritual life at work within us. Father, we marvel at the work of the Spirit in regeneration. We marvel at the new creation. We marvel at your work in regeneration. Father, we pray that regeneration would take place this day. And that even through this church, regeneration would, like a plague, reach hearts in this town and beyond. That you would be glorified, that Christ would be exalted, that your church would continue to be built up. And so, Father God, do that, we pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Well, it is a blessing to be with you here at the Lord's Supper. This is a wonderful ordinance given to the church. I like to think of it as a day of reckoning. Because when we come to this table, there's, there's no way to avoid it. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have been born from above, then you have a responsibility, an obligation, even a, a delightful duty to come to this table and partake of the bread and the cup, symbolic of the body and blood of Christ. And so with that, we have to come in a way that, that is honorable, in a, a worthy manner. And that's why in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty eight, 28, Paul says, but a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And so what an opportunity for us to consider all that we've heard this morning, to consider our lives before the Lord, our devotion to Christ, to reflect on our relationships in the body of Christ. One of the glorious elements of this Supper is that it's a, a corporate ordinance. And by partaking of the bread and the cup, we are, we are doing that together in a way that displays our unity. And there are times 
when we come to this supper and realize there are things that need to be made right, maybe with our spouse or a member of the body of Christ, and, and we should do that. Sometimes in a really awkward way, even during the Lord's Supper itself, sometimes you save it to later and commit in your heart you're going to do that. But, but this is an opportunity to evaluate your relationships with others, your walk before the Lord, your love for Christ, and really to confess sin. 1 John 1, 9 declares, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And so we can come before the Lord, remember him in his death, knowing that he paid our penalty in full and can confess our sin, knowing that as we do so, we are actually glorifying Christ in his work on the cross. Because to withhold the confession of sin is to withhold a confession of that which he died for. And so we should come to this, this supper with joy, with anticipation. It should be worshipful. It should be at times solemn. But what an opportunity we have together to proclaim the Lord's death. In fact, Paul even says this, for as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. There's a, a corporate proclamation of the death of Christ for the forgiveness of sins as we come to this table and partake of the bread and the cup. The bread is symbolic of the body of Christ, which is given for us, and we partake of it together, ever symbolic of our unity, emblematic of our unity, and also the, blood, the, the cup being symbolic of the blood of Christ. His blood shed for the forgiveness of our sins and the ratification of the new covenant. And so as we come, let's pray and ask the Lord to prepare our hearts to come in a manner worthy of the Lord and his death. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful for this ordinance. What an opportunity for us to come to glory in the death of Christ to glory in full atonement for sin, a once-for-all sacrifice for our sin, to remember him, and to even do so examining our own hearts. Father, we desire to live for you, to glorify you, to honor you, that our lives would make much of you, and we acknowledge that we come short of that more often than we'd like to admit. And so, Father, we come and want to take this time now to confess our sin. Whether in word or thought or deed, to acknowledge our sin in your presence, to, to call it what it is, and to look to Christ afresh. Recognizing that he paid it all. And so, Father, as we come to this table, enable us to come in a way that would bring honor and glory to you and be a delight to you, a delight to Christ. Empower us by the Spirit to this end, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.